All right. How's everybody doing? All right, you could have fooled me by that response. I'm going to try it again. How's everybody doing? All right, we're going to liven things up a little bit. So during this panel, we're going to be talking about building a table, and we're going to be talking about Web3 and media and entertainment. So I brought a couple friends with me. Is it okay if I introduce them? All right. I'm more of like a call and response guy, so we're just going we gonna to liven this up a little bit. So is that okay with everybody? Yeah. All right. So first up, I have the pleasure to announce my friend. She is a head of compliance at Storage Lab. Ladies and gentlemen, please make some noise for Katherine Johnson. There you go. I like that. That's good energy online. We appreciate you guys. Next up, we have the executive director of Dan Sand. We have Daniel Oyenle. There we go. Look at looking clean, brother. Looking clean. All right. And then next up, we have the founder and the director of Propellant. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Matt Osterman. Yes. And last but not least, we have the CEO of Black Tech Talent. Please make some noise for Mike Jackson. You can tell he's a tech guy because he just started streaming on the stream. All right, so thank you guys for being a part of this. You know, this, this conversation is definitely much needed. Um, but before we get involved in that, I want to let the audience kind of know you guys and what you do more specifically. So, Catherine, you could start. All right. How's this? Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Well, very happy to be here. I'm Katherine Johnson. I had legal and compliance and people ops, AKA HR, at storage. We do decentralized cloud object storage, um, which is really great for media and entertainment, video streaming. And this year we started the Storage Institute, which is designed to make in, uh, Web3 more inclusive through education, policy advocacy, and amplification of projects and companies by people who traditionally have been underrepresented in tech, including uh, BIPOC founders and women. So nice to see everybody here. Amazing. Dan? All right. Um, name is Daniel Luashe Yonloye. I am founder and co-founder of Dance and Creatives. We are a nonprofit that is sort of positioned um, to increase the number of BIPOC writers, producers, um, as well as directors um, in the greater Midwest, but eventually as far as we can go. Uh, we've, we've seen and sort of outlined a number of um, initiatives that we are sort of investing our time and energy to doing here in the Twin Cities right now. And um, uh, my wife and myself are just happy to serve and do the work that we do. Uh, Matt Osterman, I am a entrepreneur and filmmaker. Um, started numerous businesses. The latest one was an ISP in Wisconsin. And uh, I've made four feature films. The latest one is called BitCon. It's cryptocurrency related. So I started to deep dive into Web3 a couple years ago. So really happy to be here. Mike Jackson, founder and CEO of Black Tech Talent. Black Tech Talent aims to increase the representation of black technologists in both corporate careers and entrepreneurship. We're doing this by curating a pipeline of job opportunities, education, community, and then what we call culturally specific content. Amazing. Can we give a round of applause for our panelists? Wow. I'm just a comedian. There's nothing special about me. I'm just, I'm just here to make everybody's life a little more enjoyable. But so we're talking a little bit about Web3. And for can you guys kind of explain what Web3 is to the average mind that might not exactly know what that is? We can start with you, Kay. Sure. Well, it's a concept that's um, pretty, pretty early. Um, still developing, and if you ask uh, five people what Web3 is, you're likely to get five different answers. Um, it, you know, in a nutshell, it's the next iteration of, of the internet, of the web, um, based on decentralized uh, projects and applications. Um, it's distinguished from Web2 in that in Web2, um, uh, people who used Web2 were the product ended up becoming the product, as we've seen, like with Facebook and uh, other Web2 um, applications, where our data was sold to other folks. Web3, in contrast, um, focuses on individual ownership, um, self-sovereignty, uh, and right now it's still it's still being built. But there are um, a number of people taking a look at real-world use cases because there there are few right now. Um, storage is one, and today we hit number one on the Web3 index, which measures uh, real, thanks, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks, and that, that, that measures um, real-world usage 
of the applications um, in Web3. Well, I'm the average guy who is still learning about Web3. And um, I think for me, the, the, what I've been sort of learning from my friends, a lot of my friends who are really into that world um, in the technology side of things is that there is an independent buying. There's a personal buying that comes with Web3. And I think as for a filmmaker like myself, a founder like myself operating in the world of stories around film and music, um, a lot of what I'm thinking about was how can we use Web3 again um, in sort of how does that propel and push or create a, a platform for all people, for all, all, all races and all people, um, and so that we could all have an independent buying into how content and the things that we do are sort of uh, can thrive and they could, they could grow faster. And I think that's my interest in sort of the Web3 world. And as I'm doing more of my research and learning from all these great geniuses around me, um, I think that's where the, the, the individual everyday person is sort of interested in. Yeah, I, I think in, in terms of the con context of you know, creating media, um, and trying to get your stories out there and your voice heard, uh, there's a sense of community within Web3 too, where you can actually create uh, a community that didn't exist before, whether that's a DAO or, or some other form yet to be determined because it is you know, changing so rapidly. I think it gives a chance for us to kind of wrest control away from you know, the Web2 folks. The, the current, you know, the power structure and the dynamic is not great for the creators. Um, so if we can kind of get ahead of the curve a little bit, because we know those folks are going to come and try to take control again, because they do every single time throughout the history of the world, right? So if we can try to get ahead of it and, and uh, you know, kind of build this new model, I think we'll be in a better place. Yeah, I think Catherine gave the best kind of uh, answer as far as what it is and what the differentiator is um, to Web2. But I think, you know, and, and the reason we're here is, is, you know, to talk about building a table. And so Web3 is an opportunity for us to, you know, partake in this um, technology and to decide how we want to use it. You know, she mentioned, um, you know, the ability to have ownership and to track what's being created and who's creating it and being in control of our data. And so now we have to make sure we're at the forefront and that we're getting other people interested in being at the forefront of Web3 to decide how we want to use it, how we want to monetize it, how we want to create opportunities through it. That's amazing. So we all know that, it, that Web3 is going to happen no matter what. So how, how is it going to impact the people that are putting this together at the ground, the ground level? Like what, what kind of impact will Web3 have for those people on the ground floor? Well, I think we're going to be living our lives increasingly in our digital worlds um, more and more. And that's why it's really important that we take a look at who is building this technology. I mean, already when you take a look at Web 2, um, you know, just look at the past 30 years, how much more we've interacted with our phones, um, how much more we've, you know, how much time if you've got that app that tells you, oh, you've spent five hours, uh, you know, looking at your email or, you know, on Facebook or wherever. And it's, you know, it's addictive and it's designed to be addictive. Um, and Web 2, you know, in some, in many ways, the technology has taken over our lives. And Web 3 is an opportunity to make technology work for us instead. And so the people who are creating it need to be very thoughtful about how they're creating it, because this is an opportunity to change that dynamic and to change our relationship with technology, even as we know that we will be spending more time in our digital worlds. Um, but at the same time, that uh, you know, raises the question, who's, who's building the technology? And what are they thinking about? Um, this is one of the reasons that we focus so much on, uh, at Storage on diversity, equity, and inclusion, because we've seen the pitfalls from Web 2 uh, where you know most of the people building that technology were of you know of the same background. There was very little diversity in who was building it. When you take a look at um, uh, companies and projects that are started by people of color and women, many times what you'll see is that they take that opportunity to address social issues of social justice, really pressing issues. Um, I went to an event this week called Fearless Commerce that highlighted um, black women-owned businesses. And they brought uh, each of the 47, I think it was, women up on stage who were being highlighted. And as they were describing the companies, you saw that these companies were designed to address a, a real-world problem, you know, whether it was health or wellness or 
you know, what have you. And so I think that what we're going to be seeing is that this is an opportunity to make that kind of change, but we have to be mindful about it. Very well put, thank you. Anybody else wanna add to that or? Yeah, I'd, I'd just say that, um, you know, me being the CEO of Black Tech Talent, I look at things from a cultural standpoint. And a lot of times when technology, when social media, when content creation, when these platforms come out, um, they're designed in a way and then they're released and then black people get on there and make it cool. And we kind of designate how things are gonna go, right? Um, even Twitter, Twitter's just Twitter, but because of black people, you have black Twitter and that's what actually keeps Twitter alive, right? All of the uh, content creations, all of the gossip blogs, all these different type of things, even with Instagram, with the verified blue check, that was really supposed to be to verify, you know, who you are if you're somebody who's likely to be uh, uh, duplicated with a fake spam account, and even as recent as I believe this year, um, the people running Instagram still said that, like, don't hustle to get a blue check. Like, it's just, it doesn't mean anything. It's just to verify these people. But our culture made it mean something, right? And so when we have uh, input on how we're creating things from the beginning, it, it gives us the ability to have uh, economic inclusion. It gives us the ability to create with diversity and inclusion from the very beginning. It gives us the ability to go, how can this be something that impacts us in a positive way and not just from an uh, entertainment standpoint? Very well put. Very well, because I'm still waiting to get verified on Instagram, <laughs> but one day. Um, so I want to backtrack a little bit. So we, we were talking about ownership of content and each and every one of you guys are visionaries, entrepreneurs, CEOs. What, what does it take to, to put a vision in place, like to see something that isn't necessarily there and then to make it happen? Pain, lots, <laughs> lots of pain. Yeah, I mean, you know, as a writer too, they call it the tyranny of the blank page, right? You look at that thing and it's just staring at you. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I call it ass in seat. You just got to put your ass in the seat and do it, right? And really, what's the end goal? What are you, what are you striving for? And then do you have the discipline to, to go through with it? So in my case, you know, with, with feature films, it's always like, okay, here's the concept. How do you wrap a story around that? Um, to make it relevant to a little bit more to this, like I was su like super intrigued by Bitcoin and crypto a few years ago. And I said, how can I wrap a narrative around that? So I heard this story about the, the guy that had like, you know, a couple thousand Bitcoin on a hard drive, then he threw it away and forgot about it. And then Bitcoin started going way up in value. And now it's in a dump somewhere. And uh, I think $180 million worth. And I said, you know, how can we wrap a narrative around that? So you just kind of build these pieces, put it together. And that's kind of, yeah, that story. If you're spiritual, you call it faith, right? Um, the idea is that there's always to see something or to have an idea for something that doesn't fully exist yet or isn't developed and then to put in the, the energy to try to bring it together um, is it takes a little bit of energy and faith and so definitely the struggle is a, is a hard thing um, and I think what really gets us to that line is the possibility knowing that we, we want to live in that world right that's the kind of world we want to live in so we project ourselves to that place where uh, we're willing to pull energy and collaborate and find people to get us to that place where we can make it happen because we do have people excellent at different things at what they do. What we don't often have is the ability to collaborate and to figure out where what makes sense. And I think that's the work of the visionaries to begin to sort of put that in place and put their energy into making that happen and creating those spaces. Yeah, if you're, if you're a visionary, um, you know, the ideas and kind of the excitement and the passion come to you naturally. So that's not necessarily something that somebody else can adopt if they're not that type of person. They can do that probably per project, but at the end of the day, the difference between somebody who has a lot of ideas and gets excited about those ideas and then a true visionary who can bring those things to life is execution. There are a lot of, everybody has ideas. Right now there's somebody who's a janitor and they thought of a new type of mop that would make their job 10 times easier, but they don't believe in themselves enough to go and create it or make the prototype or execute it or put in the work to just find out how to create a product or how to start a business, right? And so execution is very important. And the other thing that's very important is 
if you're a visionary or you're aspiring to be a visionary, your vision has to be big enough for a lot of people. It has to impact a lot of people. It has to serve a lot of people. When I came up with Black Tech Talent, um, I called the people who are now, now my team. Leonard's one of them. He's here in the audience. And um, I was like, you know, we want to, we wanna, over the next five years, have an economic impact on the black community of $2.2 billion annually, reoccurring. Um, so that was the early vision. I said the 20-year plan is to start and service the people who are already in technology and make sure they're getting jobs and being treated fairly and being able to move up the corporate ladder, but then to focus on the youth as well and make sure you know somebody who's born today in 20 years is being scouted by Google the way we're scouted by um, um, you know sports to be able to go, okay, this is our next frontier, and to be able to go into these corporations and say, look, you guys are going to India, you're going to China, you're going all over the world, and we're showing you that you have a talent pool here that some, some are already ready, some need to be developed, but that's where the investment needs to be. And so to have a vision that you're passionate about and that you go, look, these you know, bumps in the road may happen early, but I see the big picture, and so I'm not sweating the little things because I'm gonna move forward with this and make sure that it impacts a lot of people, and that gives you something that's bigger than yourself when you are getting rejected or where you're not moving as fast as you want or not getting all the resources you want. You have this image in your head, and you have these people that you know that you're helping, um, and that pushes you to continue going because now it's bigger than you, it's bigger than your emotions and your, and your feelings at the moment. Web3 brings certain benefits that we didn't have in Web2. Um, this is, you know, through the benefits and the work of decentralization. You have greater security, um, privacy, access, affordability, um, resilience. And I, I'm really excited to see what's happening with Web3 that art largely is one of the first uses that we've seen through NFTs. Um, and it's, I, you know, I have a friend who's a phenomenal musician who has, you know, continues making his music, but essentially has given up on uh, making a living of it because artists and creators have traditionally um, and currently, you know, don't reap the benefit of their work. Um, Web3 provides the opportunity for creatives and artists, uh, content creators, to um, continue to reap the benefits of their work. I think about Jean-Michel Basquiat on the streets of the Lower East Side in New York, handing, you know, selling postcards of his work for a couple dollars, um, and then never seeing, or his estate never seeing, um, the value and the benefit of that, uh, the monetary value. With, with uh, Web3 um, and with digital currency uh, and NFTs, the creators will be able to continue reaping the rewards of the work that they've done, which is going to result in more artists stepping forward and more people creating art. <laughs> what a beautiful world. It's amazing. I want, I want to get back to what you said, um, but first I want to ask Matt. So Matt, you created a film called Big Con. Can you kind of walk us through the process of that film, what that film is, and kind of, you know, just a little, a couple of details for people who haven't quite seen it, because it's doing pretty well. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, um, probably 2017, kind of had the idea for it. Um, I just had got off a, a directing gig for sci-fi films, um, and it, I made a lot of friends, but it wasn't that enjoyable, right? When you have kind of a studio in charge making decisions for you, uh, it, it wasn't the best process for me. So I, I, I said, you know what, if I'm gonna hang myself, let me do it with my own rope this time. Uh, so we, we uh, wrote the script and raised private equity locally. We said, we're gonna shoot it locally. You know, I live here, I don't wanna go shoot somewhere else. I wanna sleep in my own bed, see my kids. Um, we have a lot of talent here that is underutilized. And uh, we kind of just said, we planted a flag and said, we're gonna do it here. So uh, yeah, raised the money, started building the team. We shot, you know, 100% here, 100% of the crew was local, probably 90% of the cast was local. Um, and this was just right before COVID too. So we got lucky in that regard, but post-production was, took forever because uh, you couldn't be in the same room with anybody. Um, yeah, and then uh, it's coming out next month. We have a Twin Cities Film Fest premiere October 21st. 
So pretty, pretty stoked. It's amazing. And hey, you can clap. there we go. And so, Kat, you kind of you kind of touched on something pretty pretty deep, and I wanted to see just how storage. How does storage play a part in this, this next era of media and entertainment? Sure. Well, when we think about Web3, we have to remember that you have to build the infrastructure first. Um, and one piece of that is data storage. Um, and so uh, it's important to distinguish um, infrastructure from the more uh, consumer-facing applications. So, you know, people think, oh, data storage, is this like a Dropbox? No, it's not a Dropbox. It's what Dropbox is built on. Um, and because we don't have, you know, we don't have large data centers, we don't, um, it, you know, it's distributed all throughout the world. Your file is essentially broken up into a bunch of pieces and spread all over. And, you know, somebody trying to hack that would essentially be like if you took grains of sand and threw it on the beach and somebody having to find those grains of sand, um, which makes it more affordable. Um, and so that's, you know, going to, you know, this question of the creation of art. Um, you know, that's one of the issues, um, artists, filmmakers, that's very expensive to do. Um, but having this kind of infrastructure makes that more accessible. Um, so, so we are, like I said, in the early stages where it's the infrastructure that's being built now, and then various applications are going to be built on top of that. And what is, what is built is going to be, you know, up to all of us. That's amazing. And, and Mike, you were talking a lot about the inclusion of people of color and making sure that you know, black tech talent, make sure that you, they climb the corporate ladder. How important is it for the people of color to, to be involved in Web3? Yes, yeah, it's, it's very important. Like I said earlier, you know, making sure that we're having influence on the way this technology is created, what it's being used for. Um, how to market it. All those things are super important. Um, but it's also important on the, on the uh, staffing side to make sure that people are getting trained and being prepared for this opportunity and this technology and being up to date and being caught up so that people aren't left behind. So it's very important while this is still an early thing to make sure that we're making uh, this, this stuff available to, to everyone. Otherwise, it's not gonna be inclusive. It's not gonna be diverse because as technology grows faster and faster, um, some businesses, it's not even uh, you know a race thing. It's like, we're growing really fast. We need to hire really quick. And this is the people who adopted this technology early and they know what to do with it. And so we're gonna hire from there. But what happens is, as you continue to grow and you do that time and time again, then you end up having a pipeline issue like we have currently. And so it's extremely important to, to from the beginning, be very intentional about making sure we're in the room. And does anybody else want to add on that? Or? Hey, knock that out, knock it out the park. So um, my next question would be, so how does somebody who may feel like they don't have the resources or the exposure or the networking opportunity get involved with Web3 or in like owning your own media and content? Well, I think that it's up to those of us who are participating in Web3 to help educate others. Um, one of the things that Storage Institute did earlier this year was we had an event called Webolution where we identified um, 60 different people, you know, all over the U.S. in different industries, um, in academia, in social work, um, in the arts, and we brought them together. Um, we had essentially a day-long retreat with three separate tracks talking about um, Web3, learning the basics, understanding blockchain, understanding what are, what are NFTs, teaching each other so that these people could take their network, you know, take that information out to their networks and expand it. And there's now, it's it turned into its own thing. If you look on Twitter, there's something called the Webolution, um, and they've continued, um, you know, each one teach one, ex expanding um, their networks um, and, and sharing, sharing the knowledge. And I think that's, that's really critical because it's easy to you know, get overwhelmed. I don't have a technical background, I'm a lawyer. Um, I got into 
uh, tech when I started at Coinbase in 2017. Um, essentially, they wanted somebody who spoke the language of regulators, and that's what I did. Um, and so I you know, moved from New York to California and started working for Coinbase and learning about tech. And it can feel really overwhelming, um, especially since things are changing so quickly and we are at these early stages. But it's really important to not get overwhelmed. Um, you know, people are like, oh, cryptocurrency, what is it? Um, you know, and it's important just to go ahead and ask the questions. You know, there, there are no stupid questions. The only stupid question is the one that isn't asked. Um, so, so reach out. And um, Johnny Helmberger is here. He's also with Storage Institute. Um, I'm here, um, you know, we're going to be around if you want to talk about it more today or also just reach out to us, um, you know, through Storage Institute and through Twitter. Thanks. Yeah, I found if you're just curious and motivated, the material's out there, right? Like, you have to do the work. No one's going to, you know, just give you a pamphlet and say, here's how, how it's done. It's being built right now. And I found that the community, community, they're all builders, but they're all collaborators, too. And right now, it's incredibly welcoming and a, a really cool time to get involved um, and a good time to start making these kind of uh, uh, changes for the future. So I would say, yeah, if you're curious and motivated, go on YouTube. It's all there. Start following some folks on Twitter and ask them questions, because nine times out of 10, they're going to respond to you, because right now, the community is just in a really cool place. So it, it's out there if you look. Mike, Dan, you want to? Well, I'm the guy who is learning about it. So I think getting curious, getting to the place of asking questions, um, it's happening. Technology has always taught us that if, they're, if, they, if they set their mind to do things, they're going to make it happen. So the truth is, things are going to change when it comes to technology. Um, as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, we have to be curious about it. You know, I met Catherine, and you would think she's actually in the technology field 100% the way she speaks, but you know, um, the whole idea is when you have conversations with people who are working in that world, I'm looking forward to connecting with Mike too, um, to learn more about what the parameters of that world is. How can, how can you participate within the world right now in terms of us as folks who are thinking about stories we want to tell in, that, you know, in the future? So the question is, how do we get involved on that level, and how do we position our arts and our craft? I think those are the questions I'm asking myself. Those are the questions that I'm curious about, and those are the questions I'm going to have conversations about. That's amazing. You touched on a, on, on a really important topic of, like, and Matt, you did too, about the collaboration and coming together and the networking. Um, do you guys want to just dive in a little deeper on that, about how important it is for collaboration and networking in this environment of media and entertainment? Yeah, I, I, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day, and they, they were like, uh, they basically said, I found like a shortcut um, in the success of growing black tech town over the last two years. And I explained to them, there's no such thing as a shortcut. The closest thing you can get in life to a shortcut is doing things the right way. And the, and the best way to, to try to do things the right way from the beginning is to find a mentor. So collaboration is huge. Um, being able to find somebody who can guide you through some of those speed bumps in the beginning. Um, with, with Web3, there's a lot of uh, new terms and abbreviations and technical things that you, know, you get to a certain point and it's easy to understand and then you might get to a place where you don't understand so much. And so finding a mentor, finding a community, finding being able to collab, it's, it's gonna help on the back end when you decide to then go and search through YouTube and Twitter and things like that. Um, but it's extremely important and that's why with Black Tech Talent we decided to build a community first. And now that we've done it, it seems obvious to a lot of people, but when we were doing it, people didn't understand why did we build the community before we built the app that we're launching, Techie. Um, why did we build the community first and why did we host events versus just focusing on staffing. Some people would ask the exact opposite. Why not just do events and leave the staffing alone and things of that nature? And so, you know, the ability to build a community, find out what everybody needs, find out what people are struggling with, having our own data over the last two years of what our people are looking for and what they need has been a big advantage and has been the metaphorical shortcut in what we've been able to do and, and grow. So it's extremely important to be able to find uh, those mentors and those communities that can help guide you through some things. Yeah, I found too, you know, film is maybe the most collaborative art there is because when you get, you know, on set, there could be, you know, 
10, 20, 50, 100 people, right? And you have to communicate with all of them. Um, and I've had the great fortune of, of having amazing collaborators. And the one lesson I've learned is you get what you give. Right? So if you're collaborating with somebody, it's not a one-way street. You've got you to gotta do your job, too. Right? You've got to show up. You, if you say you're going to do something, you've got to do it. Right? Because I know in the entertainment world, and I'm sure it's probably in every industry, but there's a lot of flaky folks, a lot of clout chasers, a lot of people trying to uh, take the shortcut. And th there's no shortcuts, right? You just got you got to do the work, and you got to respect your collaborators enough to show up. And you know, it's okay if you fail, like everyone fails, but you got to show up and try, and then show up the next day again. Don't run away with the tail between your legs and be embarrassed. No, just keep coming back, and eventually, after enough mistakes, you'll you'll be fine. And and I want to work with that person again. What I'm learning is capacity also plays a role in it. Um, you're one human being. I think you're one person. Knowing your capacity and what you can do and how far you can go is very important. Um, so you literally sometimes have to map out the boundaries of the data you want and the people you want to work with. And so the idea of saying, you know, it's like no one is an island. So you don't want to be stuck in a place where you feel like if I get out of it, I'm falling in the water. So figuring out what you need and the things, the people that are important and the conversations you want to have, the data you need, and putting yourself out to find those mentors and saying, hey, you have something of value and I want you to be a part of my circle, my world, to help inform, to guide, or play whatever role. Um, and that way you're now a little bit more focused on the, the path in which you're trying to, um, to, to strive through. And then if you change in the course or market or field or industry, then you, you change that as well. But that idea of collaboration um, placed around capacity sort of helps you drive and become more, more effective and more productive. In on mentoring, um, recently we changed at Storage the way we talk about mentoring. Before it was uh, identifying a mentor and a mentee, but we recognize that we all have something to learn from each other. So now it's mentoring pairs, and that's how I like to think about it. Um, and I also encourage people to open their networks and connect other people. I think just you know y yesterday I you know uh, sent a text because I know oh. You know, you're in film, and this friend is in film. Why don't you do something together? Here you go. <laughs> you know, and I've had I've had the benefit of that from you know people like Mike. I moved uh, here to the Twin Cities a couple years ago, and found that people were just connecting me to other people left and right. And that's that's how we do that things here. Um, and I encourage you know I encourage others to do the same because you never know when something phenomenal is going to come out of that connection. Yeah, that's amazing. My grandma always said, you never know everything until you're six feet in the ground. And if you're above the ground, that means there's always something else that you can learn. And I think that's important that we talk about the collaboration because it's, it's what we need. You know what I'm saying? We can always learn something from someone else and we can always grow each other's network. There's enough for everybody to, to, to prosper in a way. So it's amazing that you guys said that. So you guys, Matt and Dan, you guys are creators, film directors, et cetera. Um, I want to touch on the pact of owning your content. How important, and then and Mike and Kay, you guys can tap in on this too, but how important as a creator is it to own your content? It is everything. <laughs> At least for you, it is everything. Um, creativity, I mean, the act of even creating something. If you're making a film, my first film I ever made was college. As soon as I got my, my final year of college, I made a film, a feature film, and it was... It took me eight months to make, eight solid months. And in that eight months, the things that I went through to make that film, most of you don't want to go through. I was sleeping on couches. I'm serious, it was so hard because you're putting, you're not, I'm not, I'm not in the world where I'm working the kind of job that's gonna make me the kind of money to make the film one. I'm making this film to prove a point, to position myself. You know, the intention was to sort of create a portfolio for yourself. And so you're, you're casting actors, you're not paying. Um, you're, you're, but you're working, maximizing on the time you're doing to do that, having communications, doing a little bit of rehearsals, showing up to set, renting the camera, getting it done, then put, doing the post-production editing. The reason I'm even explaining that is to just show the tenacity it takes to even produce a film, and then when it comes out, people watch it for two hours <laughs> and go home, and then somebody wants to just make money off of it, and then you don't even get anything out of it. Like, that is like... That's abuse. <laughs> so that's why I think creators, uh, we, we have to embed a process in our process, which, make this, which, which makes the conversation of Web3 interesting because we, there has to be an embedded process where there is a guarantee that 
the creative actually benefits from that product. Um, it's not always easy on the front end as a creative because you have to really become a creative character that people want to see uh, to get to, to a place where even Web3 and technology could help you maintain that. Um, that, that capacity and maintain the funds that come from it. So it's everything, all of our content contracts, we, we serve as professional development for artists as well. And so all of our creative contracts um, for the clients that work with our clients, um, are, we embed that full rights of ownership to it. So all of our creators own the content. It is everything to us to own our content. And then if we choose to give it, if we choose to use it for charity, we can do that as we so please. Yeah, I, I think ownership is probably the end goal, but it's not always possible right now, right? And we're kind of in this middle ground where we're kind of straddling both, both paradigms. I know, like, in, in the film world, when you do something with a larger budget, typically you have to work with partners, right? And then you give away ownership to that, and that's, that's a deal you make, yeah. Um, but, you know, Marvel's not going to let you own, <laughs> you know, your Thor movie, right? Like, so you have to make that deal and, and figure out, okay, I'm going to get something out of this, and how can I use that for my next step, right? Always thinking about that next step, and how can I, can I leverage? Um, so I know a lot of content cr creators are incredibly excited about, you know, the promise of Web3, but again, you got to do the work, right? And so these larger companies, they'll promote it, right? They'll put money behind it and get you out there. So if you can build that on your own, you don't need them anymore, right? And YouTube and other you know, social platforms have proven that. If you can build your own audience, you don't need those people up in that ivory tower anymore, right? So you gotta kind of simultaneously uh, create your stuff and build your audience, then the power is yours, right? Um, with that said, you also have to be careful about putting too much, um, you know, if you're putting something on Instagram, you don't own it, right? Like with, with, with Bitcoin, we had an Instagram account, and, be, and it was doing really well, but because it was crypto related, they pulled the plug on it. Didn't tell us why, it was just gone, deleted, right? Um, so, you know, we've since recovered and we have another one out, but are they gonna pull the plug in? We don't know. So if you're going to build that audience, make sure you're, you know, kind of, you know, uh, all your eggs aren't in one basket because you still don't own that. Yeah, on ownership is extremely important. Um, but control is also important and understanding what is your intention behind ownership, what is your intention behind control, because you can own 100% of nothing or you could own 10% of something huge, right? So making sure you understand that and have that perspective when you're going into negotiate or partnership or whatever it may be. And, you know, we, we create content too. We have a podcast called BTT Discussions, which is sponsored by Sunrise Banks and Lifetime Fitness. Um, we're now getting ready to launch our um, web series with a superhero we created called Black Circuit. And we partnered with US Bank and Arctic Wolf on that. Um, we have all of our recap videos and things of that nature. So we put out a ton of content. Because we're able to do these direct partnerships, we're able to still maintain 100% ownership and creative control of all the things that we create, and that's, that's super important. Uh, when my kid, who's here, thank you, was little, um, I started a blog. Um, it was you know, a little bit about gardening, a little bit about life, and just observations. Um, and it was on WordPress. And then at some point, I stopped paying for it. And then I realized it was gone. <laughs> All of it was gone. Um, and so to you know, your question about ownership and content and you know, the time I spend thinking about data, um, you know, it's, you know, we can't assume that it's going to be there forever. Um, you know, it is important to take a look at the technology you're using um, and to know and understand a, at least a bit. Uh, you know, what the expectation can be and, you know, if that's reliable or not. Um, and that's also, you know, just the beauty about decentralized storage is, you know, people, I think people forget that, yeah, there are, you know, it's, there's not limitless space for data, but by having really innovative, unique technologies, we can address those real world problems. Well, one, one note too, on the consumer side, like if you buy a movie on any platform or even music, 
you still don't own it, right? It's, it's living on somebody else's server and they can still pull the plug. And I think that's kind of the promise of Web3 and blockchain, right? Like right now blockchain can't handle huge amounts of data, but things like storage can play along with that, right? So I think there's a world soon in which you can actually buy your, somebody else's art or media or film or whatever and it's immutable. It's there for good, right? And you have access to it. So I think that's kind of the, the, the goal for somebody like me, right? Like, I don't own most of my stuff. Somebody else does. And if they decide to shelf it, it's gone, right? So if, if we can find this new model where we can keep things up there for eternity, right? Regardless of what Zuckerberg wants to do, uh, you know, I think we'll all be in a better place. That's amazing. And kind of playing off that point, um, so how does how does the the average person like you know this sounds of when a, me as a creator I'm like oh my goodness how do we how do we make this possible how do we get the jump start on making Web three a, a developed thing is that something that anyone can get involved in with helping the process or is it just something that just has to naturally take its course hey, anyone can get involved in it and I think the key is just educating yourself all of you are doing that now um, you know that's not to say that. Not every person is a developer. Um, you know, I'm not going to, uh, you know, sit down and, and write code or, you know, r write a program. But I asked my, asked my husband to do it for me. <laughs> um, you know, but we all, you know, talking about opening up our networks and connecting and collaborating, um, you know, there are a lot of people who do have that ability. And if you have the vision, you know, you can work with somebody to, you know, who can help build it. And there was a an event that I was at, a panel recently, um, and you know, a, a point of advice that was given, um, and this was by uh, Brooks from Web3 MSP, he said the best piece of advice I ever got was learn how to code. Um, and it's still on my bucket list to at least you know, have some rudimentary understanding, but I think it is important, especially for young folks um, to, you know, to develop those skills. Anybody else? Mike, you look like you got something on your mind. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, I mean, she, she covered it, right? It's collaborating, it's researching, it's showing up to rooms like this. Anybody can partake, and, and like she said, uh, there's different facets of it. Not everybody has to be a software engineer. Some, but some people are really great at building community. Some people are really great at, uh, you know, getting people to rally around a cause. Right, and that can be one piece of the puzzle. Whereas you have somebody who may be building on the technology and they're not good at those other things, right? And getting the word out, getting the message out. You may have somebody who's good in, in sales and knows how to sell software and technology that can help then bring in funding or get investors and stuff like that. So it's really all about just taking those first steps to get involved, um, research and reach out to people and just figuring out honestly what you're good at and then seeing how that can add value to another piece of the puzzle. Maybe a couple of quick practical things that you guys will probably have stuff to add, but I would, I would buy some crypto just so you understand tokenomics, right, and how that kind of works. And then join a DAO, a DAO, DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, where you can partake in the community, right, and learn and just watch for a while. I think those are two kind of easy steps. Um, you have to learn Discord, which is a whole other thing usually, but um, but just start doing it, right? Just get in and you'll learn by doing and, and you don't have to invest a lot. Just kind of play around. Amazing. That's, yeah, I'm just taking it in myself like, man, this is, this is amazing and I want to see how I can use my talents to get involved into something like this. And so my, my last question, Mike, you kind of touched on it in the beginning of our conversation um, and it goes along with ownership, but we see with the social media realm, um, the, the black culture is kind of like keeping things afloat, you know, and we see the trends on TikTok, the dances, the different things like that. Um, how impactful would Web3 be for protecting that black culture? Yeah, extremely, extremely impactful because now we have receipts on who created what, who owns what, the ability to monetize as we spoke about earlier. Um, and, and the ability to rally a community behind what you're doing, which is like something that's been very hard for creatives to do. When you're spending a lot of time creating and then you gotta go, oh, I gotta get good at business too, right? And then you work on doing that and then you go, by the time you're done creating something dope 
and figuring out the business part of it, now you're like, how do I get this thing out there and build a community around this thing I'm so passionate about? And you've overloaded yourself with, um, you know, these kind of learning curves and things like that. And so to be able to, to you know, participate in Web3, where we talked about earlier, where it's about, you know, us deciding how we're going to use, utilize it and, and, and owning our data and our information and our artwork and things of this nature, um, it's going to help streamline some of that process. It's going to be huge. And, and I just want to say, you know, once again, the topic for today is building the table and, you know, what does that look like for everyone? And what does that look like in, in Web3 overall? And who's all going to participate? And those are the questions that we're working on answering today, but it's going to transform and evolve over time. I just got back on Tuesday from uh, a round table with the U.S. Senate, and I was there to speak on entrepreneurship and laws and things like that that affect us and how they affect black entrepreneurs as well. And, you know, one of the topics that kept coming up, even with the other entrepreneurs in the room, was like access to capital, ownership, the ability to scale, and things of that nature. And uh, Web3 is definitely going to be a big player in that if we're on it early enough, if we're in the room creating it. And then you guys want to touch on that? Well said. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that's, uh, yeah. You kind of hit it all on the head. As a, as a black creator myself, as an influencer, um, I, I always try to find ways, because you think you like create something, and you're like, man, why does it seem like that person took what I had, but they have a bigger audience or a bigger influence, and then now all of a sudden it becomes their thing, you know? And so I think it's important for a lot of creators, not just black, but just a lot of creators in general to be, have that confidence in knowing like when I create something, it's mine. When I, when I have something that I put out, like I have full ownership of that. And I think for, as a creator, I think that's the most exciting thing that I'm ready for, for the Web3 experiences. Like, man, just sitting here with you guys, soaking up all this knowledge, I'm like, I can, definitely see a lot of people who can take this to the next level and and it kind of changes the game really and um you you hit it on the head just being able to create a platform that brings everyone to the table not just a certain demographic but brings everyone to the table and i think that's important um so we're down to the last three minutes is there anything that you guys would like to add on um, to kind of wrap this session, give these people, we, we kind of hit them with a lot of knowledge, a lot of information, um, but to wrap this up, what is something that you think um, is important to leave our audience with before we head out? I'll say, one, thank you. You've been a great, great host, so I'll give it up to, to you. Juice. Um, you. And to all my friends here uh, as well, I think um, I've learned a lot from this as well, just like everybody else. Um, um, and I'm thankful to Catherine because we just met last week, I believe, or two weeks ago. Um, and that's, I think, the power of mentorship and collaboration as well. And that brought us to this space together. Um, and so I would say a commitment, a self-commitment is what I would like to live. It's sort of in sort of my own process as well. is a commitment to say, if the future is going to look like this, what role am I going to play in it? And how can I create something that is you know, beneficial and makes the world a better place, uh, whichever way you interpret that as a person. And I think that's, that's what we all wanna leave here with, is the idea that there is, there is an opportunity right now to begin to have the conversations and to get involved in what that looks like. And there's an opportunity for us to see what we wanna do in it. So that's what I'm gonna leave with everyone and, and I hope we all could make that commit commitment at some level in our paths. No, go, you go. I, I was just going to say, um, like you said, Web3 is coming whether we like it or not, whether we understand it or not. Um, it's up to all of us to have some understanding of what that means and what it's about. Um, that's our personal responsibility because we're going to be impacted by it. The people in our lives are going to be impacted by it. Um, it's also up to those of us who are building it um, to be responsible in, uh, in the building of it because of the impact that it's going to have. Um, you know, that means asking who's building it, um, who do you have coming to that table, are you bringing forward diverse voices and perspectives so that we can have an internet that avoids the pitfalls of uh, the past. 
Yeah, I'm just, storytelling uh, has been dominated by white male patriarchy for a while now, and I'm tired of it, right? We need more diverse stories. Um, and to have the ability for these divorce, diverse creators to own said stories and not get monetized or have it stolen, I think is gonna be incredibly fr fruitful. So for all the storytellers out there, like get to work, please. Um, and then leverage Web3. Um, so you can continue to tell those stories and, and not have some of the sad stories that I do. Um, you know, we, we have these conversations about having a seat at the table, building our own table, and just for anybody who's not clear on what that is, it's value. The table is value, right? Can I have a seat in a place or in a room where the value is being had and being added? Or can I go ahead and build my own value so then I get invited? And I think at the end of the day, it's a mixture of both. I get invited to sit at tables because I built my own table. I've built my own value, my name, my brand, what I bring to the community, what I bring to, to the world. And that allows me to go into other rooms where value is being created and added and add my input or my twist on those things. So, you know, as you leave um, and, and, you know, go on your social media or have conversations and network about what was spoken about today, the, the, the true word is value. All right, well, thank you guys, and thank you guys for having us. Appreciate it. We, can we round of applause for our panelists, please? All right. Thank you.